Good morning, everyone. Happy Mondays and welcome to the News Agenda with me, Fleet Street Fox. And today I'm joined by the Mirror's Politics reporter, Dan Bloom. And we're going to go through the biggest story of the day, which is the new Oxford coronavirus vaccine. You've probably heard about this morning. We're going to discuss who will be in tears by Christmas and we're going to end on a heartwarming animal story for you. Because it's one of those strange Mondays. We seem to be surrounded by good news. It feels really odd after the past decade or so. And through it all, we want you to ask us your questions, whatever you want to know about the Christmas tears. Dan is an expert in that. It's his mastermind specialist subject. So ask us about the tears and Christmas and lockdown, how it's going to work and get into us and ask us about the vaccine as well. Please don't say anything too stupid about vaccines. I'm going to try to be polite, um, but ask us what you want to know about the vaccine and we'll try to help you with that too. So let's get straight to it with the news this morning that Oxford University and AstraZeneca have come up with a vaccine that is 70 percent effective, perhaps 90 percent, depending on whether you get two shots. And it's not quite as effective as the Pfizer one, which came out first, but it's more effective than your usual annual flu jab, which is about 50 percent. Is that right, Dan? Have I got that right? I'm not across everything, but it seems uh, your numbers on the 70 percent and the 90 percent seem about right. And I mean, the crucial thing is here, not just how effective the vaccine is, but how much of it we can actually get in the UK. And the thing about the Oxford vaccine is it's the one I think that we've ordered the most of, of any vaccine. We've ordered 100 million doses on pre-order. So if it were to get approved and pass all the safety checks, which still haven't happened yet, we could be rolling this out in kind of the early months of next year. And in fact, Matt Hancock was saying this morning, we could get back to some kind of normality after Easter. Now, we've all heard that before, haven't we? But now that we have three different vaccines, we've got Pfizer, Moderna in the US, and now potentially this Oxford one as well, all showing some good news. It's um, a bit more hopeful than it was before. Yes, it's lovely to wake up with something positive on a Monday morning. Now, Mike asks, what time is Johnson making his statement today? You've got a House of Commons statement, isn't it? Is that going to be on the vaccine or the lockdown or both? So he's going to give a statement at 3.30, the Commons, and that's probably going to be on the tiers. So in England, we're all in national lockdown until December the 2nd, and um, that's going to be replaced with the old tier system. But the difference is that they won't be the same tiers as before. They'll be stricter, and more areas will be in the stricter tiers than before. So even though we're coming out of lockdown, we've got this vaccine news, we might have a break over Christmas. Uh, it's not all fantastic, go wild, knees up, party with your mates. Damn. Uh, right. We also, we've got, also, we've got a hundred million of these new Oxford University jabs. Now, as I understand it, um, the, the reason why we spread our bets, if you like, across these different vaccines is that things like the, um, the RNA vaccines, the Pfizer vaccine is very quick to produce but it's more expensive. It's about 15 quid a shot, I think, or for two shots per head. So, um, but the Oxford vaccine, which uses a weakened virus that causes mild sniffle to chimpanzees, and it's had the sniffly bit taken out of it, so we can use it and it won't affect us in any way. That's used as the delivery system for the vaccine in the Oxford version. And that is far, far cheaper. It's only a couple of quid a shot, but uh, it takes much longer to produce. Have they started producing that already, Dan? Do you know? Um, I'm not across the kind of production lines and everything, but I know that uh, with each vaccine, but I know that with at least a few of them, they are kind of already producing this, even though it hasn't been approved by the regulators yet. Mm. And that's just in order to crunch the time. You know, we've taken a process that usually takes several years to approve a vaccine and we've crunched it into a few months. Um, and, you know, People, um, uh, there were some people who were worried about that because it's a very quick process and all sorts of things, but they insist that they've done all the stages that would usually come one after the other, but in parallel. So they're producing it at the same time as trying to get it passed, but the government insists that this thing won't actually be given out until it has passed all the tests. Right. Keep asking us your questions, everybody. And Patricia asks here, it's the kind of thing, really, are you confident enough to have it? And it's it's one of those things that Dan has just explained. Normally, the process of a new vaccine might take about four years, I think, Patricia, um, once you've actually got it. Um, I think I myself. I've yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so normally it takes about four years for a vaccine to get approval we've done this in one year and like Dan's already explained instead of a horse 
being set off and then having to jump over hurdles A, B and C, one after the other. They've kind of started three horses at the same time that are jumping over hurdles A, B and C roughly in parallel. So you get to the end a bit sooner. The other benefit is that with the Oxford vaccine, they're using this weakened chimpanzee virus. And we know that's safe because it's been used for Middle East respiratory syndrome. It's been used for the flu vaccine and it's been used for, I think it's Zika as well. So we know that delivering the vaccine in this weakened monkey virus, ape virus, is safe. It's a good way of doing it and that it doesn't harm anybody. So that's another way they've managed to cut the time for the vaccine to get into your arm, if you like. And the short answer to your question, Patricia, is yes, I'm confident enough to have that once it's been through the MHRA approvals. The other thing we probably all need to bear in mind, and Dan might be able to help us with this, is that for some jobs and for some travel, it might be required. For example, if you want to go on holiday to wherever, the Greek islands, Greece might not let you in unless you've got a vaccine certificate. That's a possibility, isn't it, Dan? Well, it's for job titles potentially as well. So if you work in an NHS lab um, testing COVID, for example, um, obviously there's no COVID vaccine yet, but um, you're also testing things like hepatitis and that sort of thing. And as the condition of your job, you need to be vaccinated against those things because you're in more danger of picking them up if you spill a sample or that sort of thing. Um, to answer the earlier question, I would also take the vaccine. Um, if it's been through all the approval processes, I can see why people might be concerned, but um, I am not a scientist, um, not even a politician, but I am a political reporter, and I have to sort of outsource my knowledge to the very large scientific community who are looking through this and who are assessing kind of the merits of the vaccine. Exactly. Now, Mike, oh, hello, Mike, morning. Um, surely with multiple vaccine sources coming within weeks slash months, we should be taking it on the chin and staying isolated this Christmas to reduce the contagion and death numbers for a few more weeks. Now, it's worth bearing in mind, and Mike raises a point here, really, that the reason for the lockdowns and the reason for a lot of the panic and a lot of the deaths in this country is because of the pressure the pandemic puts on the NHS. That's why we were all locked down in April, and it's why we clapped on our doorsteps for the NHS. And that's partly because, isn't it, Dan, there's been like 10 years of steady attrition of the NHS. Other nations like Germany with similar demographics and similar ability, uh, similar kind of health service have had a lower death rate because they have more beds per capita and a higher health spend per capita. And it's the fact that our NHS is in near constant crisis after years, decade of not enough funding that we have this problem. And if we have our vaccines, we are helping to, you know, alleviate the problems to the NHS, which Mike's raising there. We're going to have this now again at Christmas because they want to, the government wants to reopen for lots of different reasons, uh, wants to uh, end lockdown, but we're going to have more deaths inevitably as a result of it, aren't we? Well, Mike's, Mike raises a very good point that, you know, ministers are of course unable to rule out there being more deaths from this plan, which we think will be announced tomorrow, by the way, to sort of relax the rules for about four or five days over Christmas. Um, of course you can't rule out more deaths from that because we've already had, you know, around 50,000 deaths and there could easily be more, there are more every day. Um, and Mike's point is a point that a lot of people perhaps are making, that they would love to see their families, they would love to relax things a bit, but is it really worth it? Um, and Mike, ultimately, that is a political question with political answer. Um, the scientists are advising the politicians on how it could be done because the politicians want that advice on how it could be done. Um, but ultimately, it's the politicians' decision, and it looks like they're going to decide um, to relax the rules. But the, the one thing to say, of course, is that it's not just the politicians. What if they said, you can't meet your family over Christmas, and a load of people went and met their family anyway? And then there wouldn't be any rules at all because they're just breaking the rules. So this is a sort of halfway house where you say that it looks like it might be five days where you can meet up with two other households in a sort of extended bubble and, um, and have a Christmas lunch. But at least then there is some kind of boundary. 
Mm. And one of the things you need to bear in mind and which uh, was written about, I think, in uh, Private Eye this week, but wasn't, isn't being discussed by the government, is that when you have perhaps two or three households bubbling with you during the Christmas period uh, and um, hopefully you're all COVID free, but the greatest risk of transmission of COVID in your own home is probably the toilet. And so the most important thing for everyone who's watching this, if you have family members over at Christmas, make sure there is a cleaner and wipe next to the toilet and that you tell every single person who uses it to clean the handle in between, as well as washing their hands afterwards. But one of the most likely ways of transmitting the virus, if someone in your household has it, will be on the handle or the button of your toilet when it's flushed. OK, the government doesn't mention that because it doesn't like talking about wee and poo. but that's just a fact. Now, Nicole asks, are salons open on December the 2nd and will they stay open? Dan, where are you on beauty salons? So I think it might slightly depend on what you mean between hair salons and beauty salons. So we know that hairdressers are going to open in all tiers. I think that's pretty much confirmed, although it's only announced this afternoon. Um, what's a tiny bit more up in the air is things like nail bars, um, tanning salons, tattoo parlours, pl places where you have much like, closer contact between people. Those were closed in some tier three areas um, and we know tier three is getting stricter. So we've been given no big indication that they will shut in tier three uh, and we know they'll be opening pretty much in tier one and two. Um, but we have to wait till this afternoon for that one because that's a point of detail. But hairdressers, they look like they're going to stay open everywhere. Yeah, and gyms, we think, as well, Nicole. Uh, so Non-essential shops, um, all those sorts of places sh should be open. Pubs and restaurants are a completely different shebang. Oh, OK, maybe we'll get to that in a minute. Now, let's talk about the lockdown. It's due to be lifted next week, but when it is, most of the country is going to be in either Tier 2 or Tier 3, because Tier 1 made no difference to anybody last time. It was a waste of time. And the rules are going to be completely different for those, we're told. Now, Boris Johnson's making his announcement at the House of Commons later on, and then maybe a press conference, maybe a statement to the nation, depending on which one he's less likely to be asked about, Pretty Patel in. Um, so you've been on the blower to number 10 this morning, Dan. What, what are they telling us? What are we going to be able to do or not do? What do we know? Well, they're staying pretty tight-lipped about the details themselves, but a lot seems to be kind of um, dripping out from various sources. And the main theme is that the tiers are going to be stricter. And what that will probably mean is um, tier two and three have stricter rules on pubs and restaurants. So in the previous system, um, you couldn't meet people who weren't in your household indoors in a pub in tier two or tier three. And in tier three, the pubs could only stay open if they were serving meals, substantial meals. It looks like that's going to be tightened so that pubs in tier two have to serve substantial meals to stay open. You can't just go and drink. And the pubs in tier three would have to shut all together and can only do a click and collect type thing uh, to serve alcohol or food or what have you. So that's a much tighter system. We're talking about millions and millions of people's local pubs having to be closed. That's not confirmed, but that will come this afternoon. The details will come this afternoon with Boris Johnson. Right, OK. The other so, thing, of yeah. course, is the uh, curfew. So the, uh, previously we had a 10 p.m. curfew. We pretty much confirmed that that one is dead. Um, and instead it will be sort of a 10 p.m. last orders, it looks like, and then you have until 11 to drink up. And that solves the problem of everyone spilling into the street like they did before. Or, or Matt Hancock getting caught out drinking in the Commons bar after 10 p.m. as he definitely didn't do, he said. Yeah, he insists he did not do that. Yeah. Yeah. Bad. And involves that embarrassment, though, doesn't it? And um, to keep asking us your questions, everybody, we want to answer as many of them as possible. Now, John asks, can we see our lovely family members over Christmas? I'm so confused of all of this. Um, please give me confirmation for sure. The answer to the question about confirmation for sure, John, will be keep watching the Daily Mirror's page later on today. Uh, do we know what time Boris is making his statement to the comments? Is it about three? Three thirty. Um, that's not going to include Christmas, but we should get the rules for Christmas tomorrow, John. So today's statement is everything from December the second onwards, except Christmas, and then there will be a special set of rules for five days over Christmas. It looks like it will be that you can meet two other households for sort of 
a period of five days, maybe the 22nd to the 27th, but that will be announced tomorrow. And the reason for the delay is that um, the lockdown rules today are for England, but the Christmas rules are for England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, and that's why it's taking a bit longer. So I'm sorry, John, we can't confirm now, but, but it should come tomorrow. Yeah, keep watching the Daily Mirror's Facebook pages and keep your eye on the news and uh, you will get that confirmation at some point in the next few days. Now, something I don't understand, Dan, help me with this. If there was a fear that a bit like in May, people were going to stop listening to the government and start doing their own thing, and that's why the government has therefore had to release the rules a bit over Christmas because otherwise it would look like it wasn't governing and we were all going to do it anyway. If that's the case then why doesn't it have to do the same thing at New Year? Because these, um, the possible uh, lightening of restrictions around Christmas is kind of, it's a promise of the, by the government that they will turn a blind, blind eye to us as we do what we want to do anyway. But at New Year, they're not going to be lifting the restrictions and there's still going to be some people who want to go out and want to socialise, aren't they? I think maybe it's a case of just where to draw the boundary um, because... I don't know about you, but traditionally I spend Christmas with maybe nuclear family and a little bit more, and it's quite, you know... Sort I of go to bed early because the blimmin' fireworks upsets the dog and I get very cross. That's what happens to me at New Year. <laughs> but most people um, will perhaps go to, like, a bigger party with more people, maybe a house party or a big club or something like that on New Year's. That's presumably much more contact than you would have on Christmas. So. I mean, thank God I'm not the one making the rules here, but I can see why they would um, set up some kind of exemption for Christmas because you've got all the kind of Christian uh, groups, pressure and traditional conservatives coming in there, whereas New Year's they can kind of sacrifice in exchange and say, sorry, you can't really have a New Year's party properly. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> that, whether that message gets across to people, who knows? Now, Laura asks, are soft plays going to be allowed to open in Tier 2 or Tier 3? They're, they're my bet noir, Laura. I hate every time my daughter gets invited to one of these. They're just a piss of virus anyway at the best of times, never mind a plague pandemic. Dan, do we know if they're going to be open or not? Uh, short answer is no, and the long answer is they were closed in some Tier 3 areas before. So it's a bit, they're kind of in the same level as nail bars, although not the same activity. Uh, so if we... If anywhere is going to be closed in Tier 3, it looks like soft play would be kind of on the candidate list, but we don't know for sure yet because that's the level of detail we'll only get this afternoon. Right. Thank you. Uh, I keep asking your questions, everybody. We want to answer as many of them as possible. And Charlotte asks, what's going to happen to us shielders? Of course, there's people who, despite the end of lockdown, Dan, didn't start coming out and skipping around and going to the pub because they've got someone in their family who's vulnerable and they've been doing pretty much even though the government said you don't have to shield too much anymore people have taken their own risk assessment quite reasonably and decided that they wanted to protect their families a bit so are they um kind of restrained a bit i suppose and until there's a vaccine uh in a sense yes um it's a little bit of a mess because of course people were formally told to shield two and a bit million of them back in march and weren't even allowed to go out for walks at first and now the advice for people who shielded is kind of a bit more use your common sense you know don't go to the shops and don't go to work uh, but you can go out for a walk and that sort of thing uh, we're not quite sure how that's going to change in the new tier system yet and hopefully hopefully that will be announced this afternoon and the reason I say hopefully Charlotte is because uh, repeatedly the government has announced all these systems and there's been nothing about shielders despite the fact this is meant for and it's only come later on so uh, you know we'll be pushing for as much information as we can but yeah there's there's been a little bit you know disability charities and that sort of thing are very angry about this because they feel there needs to be a lot more support yeah now abby asks uh, can children with an autoimmune disorder have the vaccine that's something you're going to need to ask a medical professional as opposed to two journalists as mm -hmm. i understand it um both these vaccines are going to be safe for the general population in terms of the methods that they're using because they're fairly well tried and tested but depending on what your children's condition is 
Uh, and depending on what your doctor's advice is, it may well be they're not able to take the vaccine for some reason. And in that case, Abby, and, and people who are listening to this, Abby and uh, the children here are dependent upon the rest of pe rest of those of us who can get the vaccine, getting the jab so that these children are not vulnerable to the virus if it happens to come into their, uh, their sphere. And it's the same with, for example, when you have a baby and they're allowed to have meningitis vaccines, I think it's about 18 months. If your child can, it contracts meningitis before then, between birth and 18 months, it's really, really, really um, very difficult for them. And so uh, babies under 18 months, their immune systems aren't up to having the meningitis vaccine. They can't deal with it. Um, so if they, what you're reliant upon then is the other children and the other family members around that very new young baby not having meningitis or not contracting it or having the vaccine already because that protects the children who are not able to get the vaccine yet because they're not old enough and with the coronavirus vaccine it will be on the rest of the herd forming a safety barrier if you like of vaccinated people around children adults anybody with autoimmune disorders if they're not able to get a vaccine so abby we can't answer your question i'm afraid specifically you need to ask your gp that um but keep asking us what you can sorry dan well a couple of useful uh, things to add to that on abby's question is that uh, first of all uh, children are not currently in the sort of priority list of who would get the vaccine it's, it's adults with um kind of disorders and that's from under 50. Uh, there's, of course, Susie's point about uh, will it be safe enough for you to get the vaccine or not if you have an immune disorder? Uh, and then there's the general point that uh, the vaccine is, um, we don't know yet exactly which groups are supposed to have the vaccine. And the prioritisation of the vaccine could be chopped and changed depending on what the safety checks throw up. So it could be that it's found to be more effective in certain groups and it goes to those groups first. So, Abby, it's partly wait and see for the government and partly, as Susie said, check with your GP. Exactly. Now, Jeanette asks, so pubs not selling food will stay shut? That's right, isn't it, Dan, from what you just said? In tier um, two and three is what it seems would happen, which is a really big deal. But again, that's one that's confirmed this afternoon. Yeah, and we're expecting most of the country to be in tier two or tier three this afternoon. And Leanne asks, do we know about holidays if you've already got one booked? Um, um, I, it depends on your travel insurance as well to some extent, doesn't it? Yeah, well, I think most travel insurance won't cover COVID these days, will it, if you booked it after March? Um, so uh, in tier two, I think you're still allowed to go on holiday previously. And in tier three, you're not supposed to go on holiday. Um but that might change this afternoon because the tears are all chopping and changing. I mean, Leanne, if, if it's it's a little bit risky. And it also depends, of course, on whether your holiday is with members of your own household or a different household, because that's two very different things, and whether it's in the UK or outside the UK, because that could depend on what part of the UK, what the local lockdown rules are, where you're going, of course, as well. So, it, Leanne, it's, it depends on the sort of three or four different things that all combine together. Yeah. Uh, I keep asking you your questions. We're going to see what we can answer as many as possible. Ron, will we need to have a vaccine every year? I think they're saying the, all the data on this new Oxford one isn't out quite yet for us to know that. But the general consensus does seem to be that these vaccines are working better than expected. And once you've had one, maybe two shots, you should be protected for quite a while. Isn't it, Dan? Uh, a while, but we just don't know how long a while is exactly. So um, we don't know is the short answer. And that's partly because the people who've had the vaccine only obviously had it a couple of months ago um, in the trials. So it's, you know, you, you can't say um, how long this protection lasts until the people in the trial have gone for a little while and had the protection. Yes. But the good bit of news, Ron, will be that because they have, this is basically an off the shelf thing, they've taken the vector, the monkey virus, which is weakened and is safe to use, and they've put into that a bit of DNA from, a bit of RNA rather, from coronavirus, which makes the spike protein on the coronavirus vaccine, right? So it's not the actual coronavirus, it's just the bit of uh, messenger RNA which creates the spike which then connects with the cells in your body and it just trains your immune system to recognize that spike 
right? And because it's like an off the shelf thing and it's so targeted and specific, then if they do have to tweak it every year, or every couple of years, like they do the flu jab, they're going to know very easily how to do it. And it's going to be much uh, quicker and simpler than it would be to start from scratch. Now, Jade asks, will we be allowed to book city breaks again? That's what you've just said, isn't it, Dan? We, it depends on the tiers. Same answer, I'm afraid, Jade, um, <clears throat> as we gave earlier. It depends on the tiers where you are, um, the tiers in the place where you're going, if it's in England, or the lockdown rules or travel rules or the place where you're going if it's outside. You know, Generally, like if you're in tier one, it will probably be okay. If you're in tier two or three, you could run into problems, especially if you're trying to go with people who you don't live with. Exactly. Now, one of the other things they're going to introduce as part of all this, we might hear about some of this this afternoon, is like a mass testing programme, um, which is going to cost £7 billion pounds, uh, on top of the £12 billion on the test and trace programme that didn't really work terribly well. And it's, <clears throat> I think I'm right in saying it's based on um, a pilot they've been running in Liverpool, which found about 600 asymptomatic people. So 600 people who could have been spreading the virus in the community, but were tested and therefore could quarantine and self-isolate so they weren't spreading so much. So yay. Um, <clears throat> but in this test, in this pilot, apparently not as many people came forward as they wanted. And they're also using these 50 15 minute turnaround lateral flow tests, which are thought to only be about 50% effective or accurate anyway. So do we know if this new testing regime, which they want to roll out for care homes and businesses and uh, areas that have high incident rates, they want to roll it across all of Liverpool and so on. <clears throat> is, this, is this what we need? Is this part of it with the vaccine? Or is this not going to be as effective as it could be? So it's um, it seems pretty effective because, uh, as you say, these lateral flow, these rapid tests are not incredibly accurate at spotting when people have coronavirus on a sort of individual level. I think it's more like 75, 80 percent when it's done by professionals. It does fall a lot when it's done at home. But it is useful when you roll it out at the same time across a whole city. And that's what they're talking about. What they're saying is. In Liverpool, they rolled it out across the whole city. Everyone went for their test, hopefully everyone, and they caught a lot of people who didn't know they had coronavirus who could then isolate and sort of break the chain of transmission. They're now saying that any area that goes into Tier 3 will get that same thing as Liverpool had. And that's that's the big thing. It's not, a, it's not about kind of catching every single person who has the virus because it won't do that. But what it will do is catch an awful lot of people who were spreading it unknowingly, get them to isolate and kind of take one big hit, like a sort of big hammer to the, to the uh, virus rate. And reduce the numbers, which will get the R rate down. Now, Linda asks, who decides what is and isn't essential regarding the shops closing? Because, of course, if you run the shop, it is essential. It's how you earn your money. Um, but uh, the government might say, well, look, a shop selling smelly candles or flowers is not as important as a shop that's selling headache pills or something so who makes these decisions dan is it the local authority or the government no it's so at the moment it's the government and then if you go into tier three previously it would be kind of a conversation between the council and the government we're not quite sure if that's going to be the same system this time because there was a complaint about that last time that it got quite confusing and that actually there should be just one set of tier three rules for everywhere. But ba I mean, basically it's the government and your council might be involved. I think I walked past somewhere on, uh, uh, I, I went for like a walk around central London um, to see the Christmas lights, socially distanced and all that. And uh, I saw uh, the shop that sells American candy on Oxford street was still open selling like- That's not essential. Yeah cups and that sort of thing but it's food so they're not it, i don't think they're breaking any rules because you can sell food but i mean is american candy essential there's, well, there's no good nutrition comes out of america is there uh well <laughs> it's not essential for your body actually not american candy it's dreadful compared to british chocolates now michelle asks i'm happy to be corrected here but as i understand it this vaccine will not stop you catching covid19 but will help stop you getting really poorly like the flu vaccine this is correct yes the answer to that question i think michelle is both what happens is if we're talking about the oxford vaccine right the weakened monkey virus that's harmless uh, that 
goes into your body and then reproduces this spike protein. OK, that's all it does. It doesn't reproduce COVID. OK, you don't get COVID if you get the vaccine. It's not like, um, say, smallpox or, or polio or something where you get a tiny dose of it and your body then learns how to deal with it. This is no coronavirus in you. All right. It's the difference between DNA and RNA. DNA in a cell. It's like um, it's like the recipe to make a cake. All right. And the messenger RNA is like the equipment you use to make the actual cake. That's the difference between the two. And what they're doing here is they're putting the messenger RNA. So not the bit that makes the DNA, not the recipe, not the bit that makes you ill and not the bit that causes all your cells to collapse. Just the, a particular tiny bit of that RNA, which tells the virus how to create the spike protein. And it's that spike that attaches to cells in your body. So when you get this Oxford vaccine, if you get it, your body uh, just learns to recognize the spikes fundamentally. And then if you were to bump into someone who had COVID further down the road, your immune system, once that COVID comes into you, can go, oh, we know how to deal with you. And it wipes it out straight away. Right? It's just that's it. So you, you don't get it. And uh, if you, for some reason, if your immune system doesn't work in quite the way it's expected to, then you will also have, according to the early research what data that's been published, you will also have a much greater chance of a really mild dose than having the full blown COVID. So it's better for the NHS. And Jay asks, what should happen to a company not having employees wear masks at work when social distance can't be achieved? This is one of those instances, isn't it, Dan, that we're talking about here almost, that there may be some employers who say, you really need to get the vaccine to work here. Well, at the, until we have the vaccine, it kind of depends where you work, Jay. So there's some places where it's the law that they have to wear a mask no matter what such as if you work in a shop or kind of anywhere like public facing. If you're talking about an office or like a warehouse or that sort of thing, it's a bit more um, unclear cut. But, you know, if you're worried about your workplace, you have to report that to your boss. And if they don't do anything about it, there are things like the health and safety executive. But there's no like one firm single rule. It's like this whole maze of rules that come from the government, from the business department. Um, it doesn't say you have to wear masks in every situation, but it does say you have to take measures to stop people being infected. Uh, they yeah. can be fines and that sort of thing, but that doesn't seem to be happening very much. It's more they will get advice and, and change their layout and that kind of thing. Yeah, it may well be in some jobs that your boss is going to say it's better if you can get a vaccine if possible. You may even get further up the queue um, to get a vaccine because of the job that you do in some cases, who knows? Now, finally, I want to talk about this great story. It's on page 16 of today's Daily Mirror. It's the headline of the day and also the story of the day, frankly, if you ask me, Home Yelp. There you go. Now, this is a brilliant story. Another bit of good news to warm your cockles of your heart this morning. This is Simon and Caroline Hall, who live in C County Durham. Now, six years ago, their spring of spaniel Bonnie was stolen from them and they never found her. But because they had her microchipped, any pet owners, get your animal microchipped. It's so cheap. Uh, she was found wandering in Cambridgeshire and they have had her returned home. And it does seem like she's been used for uh, breeding a lot. She had her last litter only six weeks ago. So this is a good bit of news, though, isn't it, Dan? Another bit. It's to warm the cockles of your hearts. And, you know, it's to have a pet missing for six years, you would just give up all the hope long before that, wouldn't you? Yeah, um, yeah. Like like Susie said, get your pet microchipped, and this sort of miracle can happen. It's just a shame what's happened to that that poor dog in between, because some of the details of this story that are absolutely horrible. She's been used kind of excessively over and over again for um by dog breeders. And yeah, they're, and they're because the spring of spaniel, they can they can charge a lot for a pup, uh, and so that's why she was stolen. She's been used intensively for breeding, and she's it's so bad she's had to have a hysterectomy when she's got home because her, her insides are, are shot, basically. And that's the other thing, everybody. If at Christmas or running up to Christmas, Bonnie had her last litter there um, only six weeks ago, if you offered a liver and white spring of spaniel pup down the pub, 
say don't don't just say no call the police because it's the people who stole bonnie and if you are offered any other animals by anyone other than a reputable breeder whose premises you can go to and who will provide you with that animal hopefully already chipped which reputable breeders should do and don't touch them with a barge pole because you're encouraging this kind of awful crime and terrible animal mistreatment but yeah. good news bonnie's back home for christmas we've got vaccines coming out of our ears and um, we've we used up uh, Susie's connection at the very last minute. But just to say thank you very much for tuning in. Um, thank you for all your questions. I'm sorry I've had to jump in at the last minute, but um, do tune in next time and Susie will be with another <laughs> far better guest. Um, and when is it? I think you're back now. Is it Wednesday? Yes, I'm back now. Am I? Oh, good. Right. OK, yes. No, we're back on. Uh, no, not Wednesday because I've got a plan power cut, but someone else might be here. But we'll be back next Monday or during the week anyway. And keep watching the Mirror's Facebook page for updates about whatever Boris Johnson is going to be telling us about the vaccine and the lockdowns later today. Thanks for joining me, Dan. Thank you, all our viewers. Bye.